Hello and welcome to another edition of the New Hampshire Filmmaker Interview Series. I'm CJ Lewis, your host for this afternoon, and I have two very special guests and close personal friends of mine with me in the studio today. The producer slash directors slash cinematographers slash location scouts slash editors slash marketing team <laughs> behind the new feature length documentary, The Refugees of Shangri-La. Please give a warm welcome to Doria Bermar Bermonte and Marcus Weinforder. Welcome guys, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Yeah. It's great to so have you. So good to be here. <laughs> so congratulations on uh, the film festival. This is your first submission to NHFF, correct? Yeah, yeah. 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 This is our first submission to New Hampshire Film Festival, and we're so excited to be a part of it. Well, yeah, I'm, I, I'm excited for you to be able to share your wonderful film with, uh, with this audience, because the festival seems to be growing in leaps and bounds every year. So that's really, really exciting. Yeah. So you guys are in the feature documentary category, mm -hmm. is that correct? Have you yeah. been told uh, when and where your film's screening? Yeah, uh, on Thursday we're going to be screening at the Loft, which is such a perfect space for the film, at 10.55 p.m. I mean a.m., a.m., a.m. in the morning. And um, then on Sunday at 9 something in the morning, somewhere else. So be sure to get your program. Marcos <laughs> is keeping his cards really close to his vest today. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's, let's talk about the film. Cool. Um, so this has been a number of years in the making for you guys, correct? Six of them. Six years. Six uh -huh. years. So, so for, for somebody who might not know anything about, about the project, uh, what's your elevator speech? Yeah. You want me to take a crack or you want to go, babe? Start it off. All right. So yeah, the refugees of Shangri-La. Well, it's kind of an oxymoron, yeah? The refugees of what Shangri-La is, is supposed to be a perfect place, a utopia, Himalayan utopia. Um, and it's about the Bhutanese refugees, refugees from the Kingdom of Bhutan. And if anybody knows about the Kingdom of Bhutan, it's, it's uh, the nation that coined the term gross national happiness as opposed to gross domestic product. And it's supposed to be the country that's got everything right. They care more about their, uh, the happiness of their people as opposed to the, as opposed to the um, economic, growth. economic growth of their nation. However, Bhutan's big dark secret, which nobody really knows about, is that they've excommunicated one-sixth of their population, kicked them out forcefully, a sort of ethnic cleansing. And, uh, and they've, in the past five years, in the past five years, over 78,000 of those people have come to America after having waited for 20 years in refugee camps, hoping to go home to that beautiful paradise, uh, Bhutan. So our New Hampshire has welcomed over 2,500 of them, and our film shares their story. And what's really neat is it's the first film to share their story. So we've been met with a lot of enthusiasm, and we can't wait yeah, to share it's it. It's fantastic. It's really a wonderful, wonderful undertaking, wonderful project, and it's it's wonderful that. Um, you guys have, are giving voice to these people who otherwise wouldn't be able to share their story because they are really remarkable stories in this film. So I have to ask, uh, this, uh, the, the stories of the people in your film are not unlike um, stories from refugees from other parts in the world perhaps, you know, even some of them who are in America now. So why, why Bhutan? What's the connection for for you to, to, to these people that you chose to make the film about? Mm. Well, I guess start, I, I always talk more than Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always I like, just fill in the gaps. <laughs> <laughs> Marcus is going to drop this nugget of I, wisdom. He right always in about does. 14 minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He always does. Well, you, you, you just said it. Um, n almost nobody has heard about the story of these mm -hmm. people. And uh, the reason why that uh, is the case is that uh, most of the media at that time when the uh, eviction happened, which was in the early 90s, uh, 91, 92, uh, most of the attention was on much more dramatic and bloodier uh, things that happened like Rwanda, Somalia. 
And uh, also, uh, what is special about Bhutan, they just introduced the television and the internet in 1999, so there was no media coverage of that whole conflict. So these people are many times called the forgotten people because nobody, nobody really told their story. And we are the first uh, feature documentary to tell their story. Yeah, yeah and so maybe um, to further address your question, the film came, I, I was living in LA and a friend of mine, is that what you were also sort of asking? Like how did, how did we want to tell the story? Sure, yeah, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just curious about, um, about the, the, the seeds that were planted yeah. for this to come to fruition. Absolutely. Um, I was living in LA at the time, and I think it's kind of an amazing story in and of itself, so I'll tell it in a nutshell, but I knew that I didn't want, I was living in LA as an actress. I knew I didn't want to live in LA as an actress anymore, but I had no idea where to go or what to do, and so I made a firm vow that I would say yes to the next, I would just throw my faith to the wind and say yes to the next person who offered me an opportunity. And a very new friend came into my life, anthropologist filmmaker, his name is Adam Fish, with which the film would not have occurred without. Um, and so he came into my life, he was making this film about the Bhutanese refugees and he, wanted to, and he asked me if I wanted to come to Nepal to work on it with him and I said yes. And so the next thing I know, I'm buying a camera, Final Cut Pro, bringing all this stuff to Asia where I've never been before. And, um, and th this was a new experience for you, not only culturally and anthropologically, but culturally, uh, artistically, exactly. too, right? I mean, you're totally. no stranger to the camera, but this was the first time you had sort of dipped your toe into the waters of filmmaking. Exactly, right? yeah. exactly. And um, something that was pretty beautiful and neat and, dare I say, mystical, is that our first meeting in the refugee camps with the whole acronym of organizations, IOM, PRM, UNHCR, they all gathered to sort of help to ask, how can we best help you make this film? Uh, we found out that a large resettlement location for the Bhutanese, which had only been happening for two months at that point, you know, they had been waiting for 18 years and then only within the last two months were they going to other places mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, we found out that a large resettlement location was New Hampshire. I was like, oh my God. So we decided, why don't we follow some of those people? So we followed a bunch of families going to New Hampshire. Um, but then when we came back to America, Adam, he said that he couldn't, he couldn't finish the film, that he didn't have the time or the resources. Meanwhile, I've got, got, I'm on the ground, I've got my camera, I'm filming these families coming to America, learning out how to navigate stovetops and supermarkets and what is America. And, um, but it became too much, about three months and it became too much work for me even, yeah. you know, to do alone. So I put it on the back burner and uh, then Marcus came into my life. <laughs> We're married. Um, Marcus came into my life and uh, I told him about the project and he, his response was, I will do anything to see you finish that film. And I said, well, I can't do it alone. So we picked the cameras back up however many years later and uh, fought, fought, fought to the end. And we started making uh, follow-up interviews four years later, how have the refugees now uh, adapted to the culture, how could they preserve their culture, how are they doing now, and uh, we kept following the, the characters and then went into the edi editing room and figuring out how to uh, maneuver all these, uh, mm -hmm. all these programs and uh, yeah, and the film grew and grew and grew. So and how, how did you find your subjects? Because mm. it's really remarkable the way that you know, we're able to follow these sort of disparate but very similar lives over the course of this 90 minutes. How did, how did you, where did you find your handful of subjects that you focused on? Yeah, um, honestly, the head of PRM, which is Populations and Refugee Management for the U U.S. government, handed us a sheet of people who would be leaving Nepal in the next week that are going to New Hampshire. And so we had a sheet and we're being like now a friend of ours, Govinda Corella. Govinda, not that he's watching this, <laughs> he's in Nepal. Anyway, he's, uh, he dragged us around and um, we met these families and we just shot them all, you know, 
because we had a limited amount of time there. We filmed all of them, and there were a few that really just kept arriving in our life. One of them is uh, the old man, Narbador Katri, who is just the most gorgeous face and gorgeous spirit you'll ever see. Um, and then Hari Dakal, he was actually um, one of our facilitators in the camps. And you know, I'm speaking about this more because Marcus wasn't there that first time and he really had the pleasure of getting to know them mm -hmm. as yeah. we returned four years later. We started citing the footage and going through all the characters and then giving them calls and asking what their life is like now. And then we just uh, sorted out the best characters who had the most compelling stories that we wanted to keep following. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Did, you find it, um, did you find it difficult to sort of uh, maintain a line between your relationship with these people in the context of making an objective, objective film? and? You know, we actually, uh, when, we, when we started to go back and filming them, uh, we had to uh, split roles. So Doria was the uh, person to interact and entertain, and I was the person behind the camera filming. Right. Mm -hmm. Or I would be do the talking and Doria would be uh, just observing and filming, so we wouldn't, we wouldn't mix ourselves into the, into the film too well, much. Well, because I can imagine there's an element of you know, these people are arriving in this strange new place they know nothing about. You know, and you have been with them since before that. You know, so you're sort of their <laughs> their person here a little bit. They're their only person here in the states. So that's that's an interesting energy, I'm sure that 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 came up when you were spending time together. Absolutely. Yeah. And in Absolutely. some ways, I'm sure it allowed them to open up more than they might have if they hadn't have met you before they came. Totally. It yeah. was a blessing. And it was also, as we went through the footage, it was also a curse in some ways because, well, it made it really specific. We can't use that because there's Doria to like just chatting it up with Kesara, you know. <laughs> like, and, uh, <laughs> but then at the same time, there's, I think what comes across in the film is a profound amount of heart. Yeah. Like it's really, the film has so much heart. And, um, and I think that that is really because we brought a lot of heart to the people and the people themselves have so much heart. And so I'm really excited for people to see the film because not only do you get to hear the tale of these refugees, you know, you hear this story, this side of Bhutan you've never heard, this story you've never heard, the tale of our new neighbors, and you get to watch what it takes to to um, move a huge population of people and the courage it takes to decide to go somewhere else, you don't know the language, you don't know the culture, and to build yourself anew knowing you might never get to go back home. Right. Yeah. Well, so. let's take a look. Um, here's a clip from the refugees of Shangri-La and we'll be right back with Dori and Marcus. Stick around. <laughs> Bhutan the government has given a picture in this world that it's a peaceful country. Nobody is known around the world about the problem that was going on inside. They didn't want to see the face of the Nepali people. Those who are living in southern provinces, southern part of Bhutan. And the army Bhutaya, go army Ayara, Tonkina Nagago, Zapazan Bursa, going as one is to canon and Satana, and Chi canon and Nakari, turning a tackle on the Grakari, Stokan and Satana, as you Zan Bursa. We were born in Bhutan, educated in Bhutan. From the country of asylum, we have tried and tried and tried for the last 17, 18 years, but still we could not go back. There was never a strong emphasis on resettlement here in Nepal. It's no longer that way. I'm going to America. New Hampshire. No, no Dakota Fargo. Uh, that is very nice, no? Their future is very nice. I'm going to get a chance to do or expose my qualities. I heard that it's the paradise of the world. Uh, <laughs> that's why we want to go to America. Welcome to America. Oh, yes. Yes, 
we're going to spend the rest of our life in America struggling with it. Well, simply coming to America doesn't mean that we are uh, having the opportunities. These are all uh, very big. But if our coming generation have a better life, I'm happy with that. That is why I'm here. That was a clip from the new feature-length doc, The Refugees of Shangri-La, and with me are the makers of that wonderful film, Doria Bramante and Marcus Feinfurter. Welcome back, guys. You, we haven't gone anywhere, <laughs> but it looks like we did, <laughs> because we cut away from us for a little bit. <laughs> um, we were just, uh, for those of you that just joining us, uh, that are just joining us, uh, Dory and Marcus's new film, The Refugees of Shangri-La, will be playing at the New Hampshire Film Festival uh, this October 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th. And you can check out the full schedule to find out uh, exactly when and where that will be playing. Um, so we were talking about uh, your relationship with these refugees and, 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 and the making of, of, of this wonderful project. Talk to me a little bit more about um, so you, uh, just man, uh, managing the, your, your equipment and your, your process mm -hmm. in Bhutan. In Bhutan, uh, well. Was it, was it just the two of you? In, uh, well actually we worked with a German filmmaker mm -hmm. who, we, it's very difficult to go to Bhutan, especially if you're trying to make um, a film about their refugees, <laughs> which they do not acknowledge exist. Right. They say that they're non-Bhutanese, um, but if you watch the film, you'll see their side of the story, which is very much, you can, you can see that that's, um, in our humble opinion, just propaganda. So, um, Marcus. They have, you know, Bhutan is uh, marketing a lot this, uh, you know, this tourism, you have to spend uh, at least $400 a day, I think, in order to go to Bhutan to visit. Oh, wow. You have a tour guide on your side all the time who's showing you all the fantastic sites. And I mean, Bhutan is a beautiful country. There's a lot of monasteries, a lot of culture. Uh, but you're probably not gonna get to see uh, the southerners, the Lhotsampa, where there's still a certain amount left in the country. And if they, keep being Buddhist and keep wearing the national dress and uh, keep uh, speaking the national language, they're well off. But if they want to uh, practice their own culture and be what, they, what their traditions are, uh, they might get in trouble. So, so if you wanted to go to Bhutan and uh, interview these people, uh, it would be very difficult. You would have to sneak away from your, from your tour guide. Mm -hmm. So the footage that we use in the film, as Doria said, is from a German tourist who went there and filmed with his camera, I found him uh, on the internet, and uh, he was so generous to provide us all his footage uh, that we could choose from. Oh, wow. And wow. so that we can illustrate and show to people what Bhutan is like. Yeah. Right. And so we picked up in the camps in Nepal in 2008, and it was me and Adam who, who shot that first bit, both of us on handy cams, you know, um, not handy cam, you know, um, but handheld. HD cameras and and um, and then that continued. Uh, you'll see in the film we used to illustrate the eviction a lot of um, a lot of comics mm -hmm. that are drawn by the refugees themselves, and we've gotten a lot of feedback that because there was no television at that time, right. no exactly. media covered it. Yeah. Yeah. So we get a lot of feedback that that's a real favorite part of the film. Um, that that's really emotional to see mm -hmm. the eviction and the, you know, raping and pillaging of these villages in uh, hand-drawn watercolor-based illustration. So that's something. Which was made by a Bhutanese refugee himself in the yeah. camp. Yeah. And there's an NGO called Photo Voice that goes into the camp and uh, does trauma work with uh, the refugees uh, through art and uh, he drew these, uh, these comics about his story, but also uh, about other people's story that mm -hmm. went into it. So we used that yeah. element of the film, and then, and then yeah, that, that's really, we edited on Final Cut Pro. Um, Mark Dole, who's our editor, uh, he was just awesome through the whole process. I mean, he came in at the end once we had raised 
um, some money. <laughs> we couldn't do the whole thing ourselves. So um, we raised some money on Indiegogo with the help of so many people in the community. And, and um, yeah, I think maybe I've gone beyond your question. So uh, to bring it back, yeah, thank um, you. I'd love to talk <laughs> about the financing of the project, too. Sure. Um, as you were as you're filming and during the, the the production process, did you have a, a target in mind as to how you wanted to approach the film as a whole, or were you sort of just rolling, rolling with the punches and sort of going on the journey with these people? We rolled with to the see punches. What was going to happen? We rolled with the punches and went on the journey, mm -hmm. and you know, going to make a second film. When we make a second film, we'll go in with a bit more of a specific yeah. idea, I think, because it was, we had a lot of footage and a lot of ways we could have gone and, and it made it a little bit more of a longer process, right. I think, in the well, end. Well, but you, were, you were mentioning too before we started shooting this afternoon, just the sense of it being like a, a mosaic or, or a woven basket. You know, you have these disparate pieces that then <laughs> you lay them out on the table and say, all right, let's Let's make a movie. Yeah. And let's find the stories that we want to tell and let's weave them together. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. So it's kind of exciting yeah. about it. Yeah. So cool. what did you learn about about the process? This being your first time, first time behind the lens. Or what did you What did you discover about well, storytelling? And well, very technical things uh -huh. that we found out uh, about filming uh, such things as like you turn the AC off in the room when you f uh, interview yeah. somebody because otherwise you're going to have problems with the sound and uh, you probably want to check that the light is right and <laughs> you know all, all the things that you do so, uh, so perfectly here. Uh, we had to uh, figure out the hard way mm -hmm. uh, to say like, okay, we can't use that scene, too much noise, we can't use that scene, yeah. colors aren't right and uh, yeah, technical things like that we had to discover right yeah and what I learned storytelling wise is the amazing opportunity of documentary film um, you make something and yes you're sitting in front of a screen for a very long time and coming from the theater um, you know where it is so alive you really take one for the team with documentary filmmaking mm -hmm. and spend a lot of time crafting pieces and um, it's really like composing music, you know, if, it's a, if this clip is a little too long, then it's a completely different journey than if you are, you know, making it more of a, a dance in this way and what does that evoke. So it really is composition based and I suppose that's just directing in general. But then once you make the film, it's there. It's alive and it's alive and its reach is broad. You know, you, especially in the world we live in today, you get that thing out there and you're affecting audience mm -hmm. after audience. We just had a screening, you know, we're going to be having a screening in Japan next week. Yeah. And we ha just had a screening in Pittsburgh. Right. And we just got back from Colorado. And so to watch, to watch it, the piece create continuously. Well, and you hope that those invisible craft choices that you made deliberately will, will resonate through, yeah. through, throughout exactly. through yeah. the film in perpetuity. I, you know? yeah. mm -hmm. I also realized uh, that uh, as a documentary filmmaker, you have a big responsibility. And you have, a, uh, by your choice, you're going you're gonna to determine how, how this story is going to be told. And or how I these mean, people's lives are represented. Exactly. How they're represented. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, I mean, yeah, we, we uh, went through many stages in this film where we uh, could decide to focus maybe more on the problems, focus more on this character, focus more on, on this issue. And, uh, but then we had a look at the uh, Bhutanese uh, community as a whole in the United States, and we realized that they're doing so extraordinarily well in this country. Right. And that we uh, decided that uh, this is the thing that we want to focus on. Right. And it also happens uh, that uh, most of our characters are doing extraordinarily well. Right. And uh, so um, as an introduction to the Americans, uh, this documentary, yeah, we chose to, to uh, 
focus on these parts. That's, yeah. that's so, fantastic. So yeah. the Americans, yeah. Or was there ever a moment when you're putting this together where you took a look at a cut and said, that's wonderful and it works in the context of the film, but that, that's not an honest representation, maybe, of, of these subjects or this person? Because a, a lot can happen yeah. when you start slicing and dicing. Yeah. You know, less, for me at least, when I think back and I hear you say that, less that's not an honest representation of these people in, like, we're, we're fabric fabricating more than it is. More so, there's one character who gets extremely sick, mm -hmm. um, and we tried to put that in the film, but we noticed that we didn't have enough to give it to serve the story. Yeah. We didn't have enough to serve him and his story and the importance and integrity of it. So it felt like exploitation yeah. in a way like, oh, and they do badly. Look at this man's in the hospital again and again. Uh, we were like, that's empty. Yeah. In the context of the film and with what we have, that really rich story is empty and is l falling flat. So yeah. we took it out. So that's what comes to life for me. I don't know, yeah. Marcus, you have, you have another idea there. Okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, can you quickly talk to me about your creative habit while you were working on this? When were you working on it? What, like, uh, how often? What time? When during the day? All we day. Yeah. Yeah. Every day. Till the night. Through the winter. <laughs> in my parents' house. Yeah. We're lucky we're still, a we haven't killed each other yet. <laughs> <laughs> her dad, her dad uh, uh, keeps telling that story that he would like drive down the driveway to his house in the evening and he would see the, the window lit and us sitting in front of the computer at like 9, 10 o'clock at night. So we really gave it our life and our heart and all the work that we've done is all volunteer work. So we had our day jobs on the side and then we sometimes put the project on hold and went somewhere and worked uh, let's say in the in the Berkshires where we also did theater and then when we when we were done with that we came back to the project and picked it up again and, mm -hmm. and did some more some more work on it and uh, so yeah did you find yourself going to any literature or other film sources for inspiration or insight yes yes like yes. what um, the Lost Boys of Sudan was a good source mm -hmm. because it's a very similar yeah. story and uh, God Grew Tired of Us, which is about right. the same subject matter. Not and, the uh, Bhutanese, but about the Sudanese. The Sudanese right. subject matter. And uh, yeah, uh, I just found that watching documentaries helps a lot, making documentaries. Well, then you begin to watch them differently too yeah. after yes. you've made one. Yeah, you think like, oh, yeah. that's an interesting choice. You, you didn't have to do that, but you could have done it like mm -hmm. that, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. now you're cutting to that. I know why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, and you financed this primarily um, through Kickstarter or Indiegogo, is that correct? Indiegogo, yes. Entirely yeah. through Indiegogo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've, we realized at some point that we needed an outside eye for the project. And uh, because we had been with it for so long, we just couldn't see all these f uh, fine differences anymore. And so we decided to get an editor uh, and uh, for editing, for sound correction, for color correction, we raised ten thousand dollars on Indiegogo from close friends and family. Thank you, everybody. You made this project yeah. uh, happen, and uh, that's uh, that all went into production right away. Great. Which is like making a film on a quarter. Like it's a tiny, tiny, tiny budget, and I'm really yeah. proud that we've come up with something right. um, really beautiful from that. And yeah. and people were really, really, really supportive of the project. Yeah. I want to just reiterate that Mark was amazing. You know, yeah. Carlina, Carlina Lyons. She, um, did I say your last name right? Lyons. Yes. Yes. Sorry, Carlina. Well, you guys should be <laughs> exceptionally proud. It's a really wonderful piece. Um, we've got to sign off here, but would you guys uh, be able to stick around for a few minutes and we can add some content to the web episode? Absolutely. All right, great. Uh, you're watching the New Hampshire Filmmaker Interview Series. Uh, my guests this afternoon were Doria Bermonte and Marcus Weinfurter. Uh, they're here talking about their film, The Refugees of Shangri-La, which will be at the New Hampshire Film Festival uh, October 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th. So uh, thank you for watching today and we will see you at the movies.